You're listening to the Curiosity Collective podcast. I'm Arpita and I'm Deepika. W. H. Auden, the poet, once said, "Thousands have lived without love, not one without water." In these times when we find ourselves barred down to those essential questions of who we are as a species and how we interact with the world around us in ways that might heal instead of harm, it seems fitting to come to this topic of water. because nothing really is more elemental uh, be it in the form of vast oceans torrential rains rivers gushing down from mountain tops to springs and geysers and lakes and wells water is one of the building blocks of our bodies and our habitats this episode like the previous one was recorded pre covid but its relevance and urgency remains as we find ourselves mid monsoon having just recently put behind us the experiences of cyclonic storms in west bengal and maharashtra even as assam finds itself reeling under one currently our conversation with vishwanath continues us down the exploration of this month's theme of the frugal city and attempts to open new ways of understanding how we can temper our relationship with water quench our multiple needs even as we respect and adhere to the limits and laws of the larger ecosystems i hope you enjoy the conversation in the last episode i met chitra vishwanath who was talking about sustainable cities and what that means so i think it was fate that you ended up doing the second interview with her partner yeah after you met chitra vishwanath and told me all those lovely things about their ecologically friendly home and office i was of course excited And also Vishwanath her partner who I was going to interview is regarded as one of the foremost experts on rainwater harvesting in India. Over the last 34 years he has been the ex secretary general International Rainwater Catchment Systems Association. He's been trustee and advisor to many prominent NGOs. He writes extensively on the issue of water and is currently a trustee of the Biome Environmental Trust and a director with the Biome Environmental Solutions. Yeah, my name is Vishwanath. Uh, I'm a civil engineer and an urban planner by qualification. I've been working in the sector of water and wastewater and sanitation for the last 34 years, with special focus on Bangalore city as my sort of laboratory. The story of Biome, both the trust and the architectural firm, are intertwined within the larger lives of this couple, right? and together they've charted what seems to me to be a really lovely journey to explore what sustainability means in indian cities and today uh, we'll look at this story from his perspective uh, maybe i should begin with what got both of us intrigued his famous online moniker zen rain man so did you figure out what the origin story of zen rain man is yes he explained it Well, there's been a lot of serendipity on the way. Uh, I was not particularly interested in water as a sector during my studies or during my first job, but uh, as part of my work with Hard Co Housing and Urban Development Corporation, I had the opportunity to visit many villages and small towns all across South India. And one could see that what was an impending crisis in the 80s and 90s itself. So, therefore, one's attention got drawn to that. particular area and to see what communities and individuals could do to manage water better and therefore rainwater harvesting became some sort of an inquiry in my mind with that uh, zen has been a philosophy which i've been particularly interested in since my youth and rain man actually comes from the dustin hoffman movie called rain man which is about a special child or special person who has these particular powers but is also specially enabled or disabled so I club those two together to become zen rain man just to get an identity on gmail and then it became an identity on twitter and facebook and youtube it's been quite a nice journey that way that's a great back story to the name so it was his job with hatco which is the housing and urban development corporation that got him interested in water related issues Yeah and he explained that back in those days because of his job he was able to travel extensively through the southern states of India where Hadko was undertaking a gigantic rural housing scheme in the 1980s 
And when one went to these uh, housing colonies and rural villages of all these four southern states, one saw many of them lying empty. And the only reason was that there was no water. So in a lot of places, sheep and goat were tied. People would just use it as a storehouse. And it became clear that unless we addressed water, all the housing issues would stand as before. So one started to look at why what was not getting delivered and one found out that it was actually a resource issue as much as a management issue and that groundwater, which is the dominant source of water in rural India and especially rural Karnataka and rural Tamil Nadu was simply running out and in summer it was simply not available. And therefore one started to figure out what should be done if groundwater is running out and the interest in rainwater started. So how did he make the leap from rural to urban from there? I did ask him this, of course. uh, But I think later I realized that in some ways, this question doesn't really make sense. But we'll get to that in in a bit. Um, So this is the place in the story where things got familiar. You remember Chitra telling us about how they decided to try the idea of building eco-friendly houses by experimenting with building their own house. Yeah, she'd said that no one was willing to build a house with mud blocks in the early 90s, so they just decided to do it themselves with their own houses and experiment. And what a beautiful space it is. Well, Vishwanath's engagement uh, with urban spaces, as he explained, also began with this personal project. It started with us building our house in 94, and so we wanted to make it as eco-friendly as possible, so we were building with earth, we had dug up a basement and we were building the house, but we could not access the urban utility water because the urban utility would not give you permission to draw water for construction of a house. It continues to be the practice. So we were buying water from a tanker because we didn't want to drill a bore well. And at that point of time, when we were uh, building this house, it was raining. And then you could see that all the rainwater was running out into the drain. And we had this tanker uh, for which we were paying money and buying water. So we thought, hey, let's try and make sense of it. So we started to look at the rainfall patterns, rainfall intensities, and how much volume of rain falls on a particular site. And it was quite an aha moment because on our 3050 plot, it was about one and a half lakh liters of rainwater falling in a year. And we were just allowing it to go waste. So we started to do something about it, collect it, filter it, try to understand the quality, quantity, distribution. So therefore, rainwater harvesting started. It makes sense that it began as a way to figure out how to use the resources around them more efficiently. So they'd already begun embodying the principles of being ecologically sensitive. But did he say if there were any particular influences for where this came from? He mentioned how during their early days, he of course didn't have access to the internet like we have now. And hence, there were a lot of these serendipitous meetings with books by people like Rachel Carson and Laurie Baker. Yeah, I remember we talked about this in our last episode as well, that all these influences encouraged and pointed to living simply and with less. And so automatically, it meant less pressure on the resources like water being used, and more importance was given to how it was being tapped and used. Yes, and it seems to me that uh, chugging along this path of exploring the various strains of ideas in his mind, he began the Rainwater Club in 1994. And he was still working with Hutko back then and made the move to do this full-time much later. So the Rainwater Club was then this idea, great idea with the web. Hey, can knowledge be open source? Can it be free? Can everybody access it? So can we then form a club, which is just a gathering of people on the virtual uh, platform? sharing ideas, experiences, knowledge, putting it all up there and you know, taking it and running with it where one could. So that's how the Rainwater Club started. It compiled a lot of information on how people were doing rainwater harvesting, put it up on as case studies, as stories, as videos, a YouTube channel also. And uh, it sparked a lot of conversations with globally. And so I luckily went on to join the International Rainwater Catchment Systems Association and became the Secretary General of the International Rainwater Catchment Systems Association, where we were this global bunch of practitioners and academics wanting to explore and push rainwater harvesting as a solution globally. So that started with the Rainwater Club. So we learned a lot from many countries. That was in the early days of the internet, right? At the cusp of when India got access to it? Yeah, he referred to this. And I think now we are also used to having internet in our pockets that 
We forget what a tremendous shift it was in terms of access to knowledge, ideas, people, places. It allowed him to create an international community and build a pool of solutions and ideas. Um, he spoke to this with an example. So I went to China and saw the systems of uh, rainwater cellars, which they build in Gansu province, which is one of the world's largest program, program you know, 45,000 liter, 60,000 liter rainwater storage systems. But more interestingly, I saw poly houses, that these plastic houses storing rainwater and using drip irrigation to fertilize whatever was the crop growing inside it. And so they became energy and water independent. So I got that idea back to India and we built the first poly house with rainwater harvesting system in the GKVK, the University of Agriculture Sciences. And that happened because one saw it in the web, one went to China, one learned about it, and one was able to come back here and translate it to action. Road runoff and rainwater harvesting on from roads was something else that we picked up from the web and from China itself, and then we started to do it here in, in Bangalore. So the Rainwater Harvesting Club in many ways allowed for an exchange of ideas. And it was this work which, in time, as he said, got practically packaged and consolidated as the Biome Trust. It has a more formal structure now, and he shared what his vision is. One of the key ideas is that it should be not too heavy scientifically. It should be more communication-oriented, and it should learn from people what people do. It should quickly take it down as uh, information which people share with others. So we trigger communities, we help them understand what rainwater harvesting is, but people do the work on their own. So the trust now is, uh, uh, it's a combination of think and do, not a think tank, but a think do tank. It's something that's always felt powerful, just the act of thinking and taking action and having one feed into the other. And so now when we come to the thick of it, tell me about the work they've been doing. Well, before we get into that, he described the scale of the problem that we're looking at. Also, let me give you these kind of statistics. When we got independence, India was about 350 million people. Now we are 1,400 million nearly. When we were independent and we were in the 60s, we were producing 10 to 20 million tons of grains. Now we produce 230 million tons. So we are one of the largest producers of wheat, rice. The Green Revolution unleashed hybrid yielding varieties which demanded a tremendous lot of water. We had about 500 to 600 dams. Now we have 5,500 dams on our rivers. We had uh, less than 50,000 bore wells. Now we have 33 million bore wells. We are the single largest user of groundwater for any country in the world. So the demand of the economy, especially energy and food, has put a tremendous strain on our water resources. And therefore, water has run out because we've got the same endowment as during independence, 4,000 billion cubic meters or 4,000 cubic kilometers of rainfall. Now the challenge for us is to do more with less water and to be able to revive our rivers, to be able to revive our lakes, to be able to revive our groundwater. And for that, we need to be efficient with our water use and our crop production. And we've got to be smart about how we ecologically intervene in areas which are sensitive, like, for example, our forests or the Western Ghats, where we need to protect them so that our rivers flow and our water is protected. Right. The resources we have are the same, but with the population increase, the pressure on those resources has increased immensely. And looking at resources, it's not unusual anymore to hear of cities running out of water. I mean, just last summer, I remember how Chennai was in a dire situation. And before that, it was Shimla, where tourists were asked not to come because literally there wasn't enough water for the locals living there. So I asked him then how urbanization in particular played a part in this scenario. Urbanization means that there's a concert concentrated demand on water resources. And sometimes urbanization also means that there's a lot of wastewater flows. Urbanization also means industrialization and therefore industrial effluents coming in. But urbanization is also positive in the sense urban areas are the most efficient users of water in terms of physical water use. And urban areas have the wherewithal, the financial muscle and the intellectual muscle to be able to deal with water much better. A hectare of sugarcane production uses two crore liters of water. An urban Indian consumes less than 100 liters per capita per day for both life and livelihood. 
So urbanization is a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity at the same time. I'm not sure I fully understand the bit where he says urban areas are more efficient in water use. Uh, he did explain it. And uh, this is the part where I realized how asking urban specific questions on water seems a little narrow as an approach. Um, because one thing that is brought home at once with the topic of water is that approaching it from the artificial lens of human boundaries of rural and urban just doesn't seem to work. Rivers, underground networks of water, lake systems, um, these are all highly interconnected systems where something that happens in one region, be it rural or urban, impacts the other. I remember in a student film I'd worked on many years ago on rainwater harvesting, we looked at just that in the context of Mumbai where water supplied from lakes almost 100 kilometers away. And we'd actually traveled to Vetarna in rural Maharashtra, which is one of the lakes. And the journey that and the journey there alone brought home just how deeply connected we are. Yes, it's odd in some ways to emphasize this, but in the era of thinking that your water just comes out, you know, with the twist of your tap, these interconnections are very important to acknowledge and re-engage with. Contrary to what people think, city is a very efficient user of water. Uh, the real problem in a river basin, the real problem in India with water is agriculture, which dominates water usage. 85% of water is used by agriculture. And within agriculture, if four crops consume 70% of the water in agriculture, you know, mostly rice, sugarcane, cotton, and wheat. Now, we're growing sugarcane in areas where it's completely untenable to grow sugarcane, groundwater-based irrigation. We grow more sugarcane than is necessary. We grow rice, we grow wheat, which is in excess. We export rice and wheat. Some of it rots in our go-downs. So the real challenge is, how do you protect the livelihoods of our rural people without being surplus and wasteful with our water use? Urban areas have a challenge, in my opinion, of a lack of investment in infrastructure which means that we'll invest little in getting universal water access to everybody and universal access to sanitation connection, there where we pick up all the sewage, collect it, treat it, and then release it into the environment. So if we get our uh, investments right, and if we get our agricultural pattern right, we don't have a water crisis. But if we don't get agriculture right, we have an unending crisis. So this city is now a global city and it's providing jobs to everybody. But it's woefully badly planned for the space of expansion that it's going through. And especially with water infrastructure, we're caught in a bind because there are ecologists who argue that it's local lakes and local rainwater which is going to support the city. Whereas the infrastructure guys argue that it's the outside water which will support the city. Now, if you don't sort out that argument quickly, we have a problem of shortage as we are now facing. So what is his approach to the situation? I mean, do we have to choose between large infrastructure projects and having piped water to cities from longer distances? Or is it about improved management of local lakes and rainwater? I think how he sees it, it's a combination of both of those. So my argument is this, that we must look at local water, but our lakes are more ecological and social spots. They are not going to be providing water for the city for its drinking purpose. Rainwater will need to be utilized to its optimum in terms of storage and recharge, and we'll come to that later. But it will continue to be a supplement to the major water demand of the city. A very important supplement, but still a supplement. But we will have to take more water from the Kaveri, but we'll make sure that we treat the wastewater and send it back to the agricultural area so that it's utilized productively. And if that is done, then the city has sustainability. But if it's not done quickly, then the city will cry for water scarcity for some more time. I asked him if the scenario that he was explaining based on Bangalore was also reflected in other cities across India. And he said that while there were variations, this was a conundrum that was common to most cities. So the city has to start to get responsible for the basin and it has to think about the integrity of the flows in the basin and in the dam, but also the people inhabiting the basin and make sure that there's a compact between the city and the region so that 
there is equity delivered in terms of environmental justice and social justice in terms of access to water. But it's inescapable that we will have to go far for, from our cities to get water. This makes sense because cities don't often have an equal relationship with the areas around them and they tend to be more extractive. So that relationship needs to change, but an equal distribution of resources and access to them is what we should be aiming for. I think through the long history of his work, he has been able to engage at various levels from policy to the, to the field, to the ground. Yet he did emphasize the need to put more energy behind local work that's happening. There's been an unfair investment in the broader, larger infrastructure without looking at the potential of the local. So we got to understand what the local can do. And the local can do a lot. In many cases, it can make the larger infrastructure redundant. It can. But what you see is when you, when you look at the city as a whole, the first charge should be for the local. And the second charge, that is when it's inevitable, for, should be for the larger infrastructure. And how do you tie these two, two together in planning and design and management terms? It's not something that's happening in India at all. So it's always either or. So the votaries of the environmental movement argue local, local, local. The votaries of the large infrastructure argue dam, dam, dam or reservoir. But what's the combination between the two which works ideally and which is sustainable? That's not been explored enough. And therefore, that exploration starts with understanding what the local can do to its full potential and then to fit it in within the overall paradigm of sustainable water management for the city. So when we speak to the local, do you mean pre-existing lakes, wells and tanks? Because I remember coming across these water sources in Mumbai like Ban Ganga, which was part of a temple complex and historically a source of water for local communities. And the same is true for Bangalore, where the old lake system was built for irrigation purposes. And back then, when the population was really low, it could also manage supplying the drinking water. But in the context of the current population, Vishwanath said that if the lakes of Bangalore were to supply drinking water, it wouldn't last for more than 15 days. So considering this, he felt that the role of lakes needs to shift now. So they have been great cultural spots. We've had celebrated uh, festivals around uh, tanks. We've gone and immersed Ganesha idols. We've uh, immersed flowers after puja and all that. We will continue to do that, but we'll have to do it in an environmentally benign fashion. The tanks will become community spaces where local neighborhoods will gather for cultural events, for uh, public events and celebrate it. They'll also be ecological spaces where birds, small mammals, reptiles will be celebrated as part of the city itself, painted stores, pelicans coming in, cormorants, it's a joy. So these will be ecological and social spaces of that nature. They should not be imagined as drinking water sources. If we link all the tanks and make sure that the Raj Kalbets are protected, they will become excellent flood mitigation structures. The city needs flood mitigation structures. So they'll become, they'll play a role if needed. There'll be excellent spots for fishing, providing livelihoods and fish and proteins to the city, you know, when fishermen fish in sustainable manner. All those roles are very much essential to the quotient of happiness for a city and the quality of life of a city. But it's not for drinking. I see why caring for these spaces and supporting them is crucial. Well, for one thing, flood mitigation, as he says, but also as spaces that can encourage biodiversity. But then where does the city turn to for its water supply? And what's the solution? I think it's the solution that he has put so much weight behind through his years of work, rainwater harvesting, and he defined it for us. So rainwater harvesting is defined as a process of collecting and storing water for future productive use. Yeah. Now, storing can be in some tanks or tanks, rain barrels or HDP tanks, or the storing can be in the aquifers below the earth, you know, which is what you would call groundwater recharge. In India, we understand groundwater recharge is also rainwater harvesting. Globally, it's understood as managed aquifer recharge. So as he explained it, before you take up rainwater harvesting, you first have to understand and map the distribution and the total volume of rainfall in a city to see how that water can then be productively used. And of course, this will be impacted by the nature of urbanization and how much built up area there is. If a site is not built upon, 
10 percent of the rain goes into the aquifer and recharges the groundwater a maximum of 10 it could be less about 15 percent runs off from the site and enters the storm drain network and about the rest that's about 75 percent of the rain stays in the soil up to one meter and evaporates or evapotranspires because you have trees bushes shrubs and grasses which do that once you build on the site now there is absolutely no recharge because you built and paved up 100 percent of it there is no evapotranspiration because there's no grasses bushes or shrubs 90 to 100 percent of the rainfall goes into the storm drain whereas it was 15 liters before now it's 90 to 100 Okay, that's a huge difference when it's a built-up site. So essentially where 15 liters was going into the drain, now it's 90 or 100%. Right, and uh, that's why you have urban flooding and at the same time water shortage because your groundwater is not getting recharged and um, so rainwater harvesting is a way to address this differently. Now rainwater harvesting says, let's use this water smartly. Let's try to store this water and if we can't store the water, let's recharge it water into the aquifer. How do we do the recharge? You make something called a recharge well, which is three feet in diameter and about 20 feet deep, lined with the rings. The traditional well diggers do it. We'll come to that later. But all you need to do is build a recharge well and put all this one and a half lakh liters into the recharge well and it will all sink in into the earth, making sure that the aquifer is filled up and is available to us as a city for later use in summer or other particular times. So it's a simple way of collecting and storing rain for future productive use. So the recharge wells he's talking about, that related to the Million Wells project you told me about? Yes, and uh, I found it particularly interesting as it's simultaneously a livelihoods project as much as it's a rainwater harvesting project. The Million Wells project which we've launched for Bangalore looks at the traditional well digging community called the Manwaters. These people have been digging wells, cleaning wells, deepening wells for about 800 to 1000 years all across India and in Bangalore for about 300 to 500 years. Now they are out of a job because nobody's building a well, everybody's drilling a bore well. So how can they be productively used in making water security and ecological security for the city? Like I explained, if they become part of the rainwater harvesting system and if every plot in Bangalore and there are two million plots in Bangalore. If every alternate plot in Bangalore, one million of them, build a recharge well and make sure they send in 150,000 liters of water into the ground, then the city will not run out of water or groundwater. If we don't do it, then we'll run out of water. Now, if the million recharge wells are put in place, there will be no flooding in the city of Bangalore. That's an added benefit. And it's mandatory now as per the policy and the building bylaws for you to do rainwater harvesting. It's compulsory for you to do. So follow the law, give these guys who are digging wells a chance at a livelihood and build water security for yourself and for the city. That's the goal of the million wells. So how many out of the million have they got to? He said that as per last count, they were close to 1,20,000, which is about 12%. He explained how it was a matter of putting the city's energies behind the project. In this office where we are sitting and having this conversation, we have a well and the well has water at 20 feet. We've forgotten the memory of it. So we say, hey, let's identify these pockets where the wells are there and where the aquifer is high and you can use the water and clean it and deepen it and recharge it with rainwater. So the well diggers have a chance. So you bring these 10,000 or 20,000 open wells which have water into business supplying water, supplementing the recovery water. If I have a well and it has water and my neighbor does not, let's share that information and the neighbor can dig a well and recharge it. The street can then do it and the ward can do it. It can identify areas where there are valleys or where the aquifer is high and, and start using the resource, right? So if we grow from these pockets of open wells and start to expand it, we'll get to a million pretty fast. He went on to give the example of how a combination of reviving pre-existing wells and digging new ones changed how Cubbon Park, one of the largest parks in Bangalore, was able to rethink its use of water. Cubbon Park was looking for water. The heart of the city, the garden, 220 acres. It did not look for wells. So when we spoke to the old gardeners and to the people, we found seven open wells and we cleaned it up. And now, yeah. Though, yeah, in Kaban Park. So in so in Kaban Park, now those seven open wells are providing a hundred thousand liters of water every day. The groundwater table is high, 
Then Kapan Park did 64 recharge wells. And so we helped them do that with Friends of Lakes and others. So now it's going to recharge every drop of water that falls on the park and its wells will be used for all the water requirements. Not all the water requirements, the majority of the water requirements of the park itself. I am banked on 64 recharge wells, put it in the water. Now it's bore well levels have come up and it's now getting sufficient. Wheeland Axel plant of the railways cleaned up four old open wells, is digging two new open wells. They get three lakh liters of water from these open wells. They don't want the Kaveri water from the BWSSB. So they've saved the three lakh liters for others to use from the Kaveri. So there have been example after example in large areas and in small households where the wells have been revived and have started to provide water. We need to expand on these uh, success stories. This may not seem like an insight, more like an obvious truth, but uh, still when he was giving this example of Cubbon Park, it struck me that there's something very powerful to the image of a well versus that of a bore well. What do you mean? I simply mean that a well in its structure and design is a two-way street. Um, It is simultaneously about input and output. A quality of openness is built into it. Uh, Whereas a bore well is structurally one way, it's extractive. You know, that immediately reminded me of the steppers that you see in Mughal architectures where, you know, the Baudi is built in the Purana Kila in Delhi or at the Dargah of Hazrat Nizamuddin. Just the very design and aesthetic of it allows for an engagement and a conversation with water that's beyond the mere extraction of it. A bore well is very costly. Nowadays, uh, you go to a thousand feet deep, so it costs you about four lakh rupees to dig a bore well. And then you're unsure whether you'll strike water. And you're unsure if you strike water, how long will the water last? The quality of the water that comes out will have high salinity, sometimes fluoride. Whereas an open well is annually replenishable. It's not that an open well will work everywhere, but it will work in particular aquifers and will work pretty well. And you'll be taking out the water that you yourself have replenished. So therefore you're sustainable. With a bore well, that's not the case. So therefore we need to get back to the culture of the open well in terms of uh, metaphorically understanding what open wells are. Annually replenishable water instead of the bore well. But even bore wells can be recharged. So. We can do a combination of both open wells and bore wells, but giving first charge to open wells and looking at bore wells as the second alternative. I also asked him about the work he's been doing with lake groups around the city. I had read that uh, he had been involved with the restoration of Jakur Lake and uh, he explained it. So the lakes have a particular propensity in urban areas that they're recipients of wastewater, usually untreated wastewater. If we have to create a paradigm for protecting our lakes, we'll have to deal with these wastewater that flows in our stormwater drains and in our sewage lines, which are not perfect. One idea is to pick the wastewater, treat it to adequate standards, send it through a constructed wetland and allow it to fill the lake so that the lake is full. So transform wastewater into a resource which keeps our lakes full with its fishes, with its birds, with its biodiversity, as well as replenishing rainwater. So one of the first works was in Jakur, where it, there was an institutional collaboration with BWSSB, the BDA, BBMP, and Jal Potion, which is a community group led by Dr. Annapurna Kamal. But together, we're trying to see whether we can adopt this principle of what's called the integrated urban water management uh, to restore the lake. And now if you go to Jakur, you'll see it teeming with painted stocks and uh, pelicans. So. So that's a rejuvenation. So that's been seen as a model which is being replicated in Delhi, Agra, and many other cities, uh, Hyderabad, where people have come and taken a look at it and learned from it. And the transformation was intense as he described it. So the before of it was that it was a pristine lake with large paddy fields. Then it deteriorated as the area urbanized and it became a recipient for solid waste, construction waste, and untreated wastewater. Finally, now it's treated wastewater and the lake always full and the biodiversity hotspot and the recharge zone. I couldn't help notice how through our entire conversation on the work he's been doing the past 34 years, there was this strong emphasis on mentioning the contributions of and the collaborations with other people in communities. Is that a conscious part of his approach? Uh, Yes, definitely. Uh, From what I saw and heard, this community-based approach is embedded in his work. It really seemed to me that the Zen in his online persona is also very imbibed in his approach to work and life as a whole. So the overall Zen approach is from that philosophy that when good people do the work, the people said we did it ourselves. 
Now, there's a powerful message in it. It's very difficult in this day of branding and identity for you not to claim credit for the works that you do. But we as both Rainwater Club and Biome Trust are happy to give the complete credit to farmers, well diggers, community organizations to say they did it and that we were at best facilitators of knowledge, facilitators of connects with people who could do the work, but allow people to own and champion the work which they actually they have done. Now, if you're willing to allow credit to be taken to others by others, then you can get a lot done. That's really beautifully put, but it's a hard one, isn't it? I mean, in the kind of world we live in, you don't really hear this very easily, but it does make sense. I think this this was the fundamental ethic of the development sector and of the conversation around empowerment. Yeah, and it's a powerful one because taking ownership of a project, feeling like you're a stakeholder in the running of something valuable to you and your community is a powerful story that not only becomes the sticky glue that keeps communities together, but also helps ensure the longevity and maintenance of the undertaking itself. So how does he imagine a water-resilient community or city to be? I think this element of people taking responsibility of their own resources is certainly an important aspect of that imagination. So there are multi-layers to water resilience. One starts from personal responsibility and a sense of design among architects and engineers and planners to make sure that we maximize the resource that is local. Yeah. So which is rainwater, groundwater, treated wastewater and the nearest lake. So every citizen, she has to engage with the rainwater that falls on their house, but also the community lake and make sure that both are working well. But at the same time, we have to hold our institutions responsible and accountable for the services they deliver. And so therefore, we need to put pressure on the institutions to be transparent and open about the systems they're putting in place, about the tariff system, about the resource system, and the kind of efficient way that they want to work with it. So if we get the governance and the institutions right, and if we get personal actions and community actions right, then we have sustainability. It's interesting that he talks about personal responsibility because rainwater harvesting can feel like a somewhat impersonal issue. And what can I as a citizen do isn't always obvious. So what did he say about that? He defined the kinds of personal action that citizens can take to improve the city's water resilience. So every household should use water efficient structures, devices, showers, taps, flushes, washing machines. Every household should look at recharging aquifers as much as possible. Every household should, and every individual should look at engaging with the nearest lake and becoming part of the Friends of Lakes or a community group which is cleaning it up in terms of solid waste management and lake rejuvenation. Uh, They should demand from the ward committees that they be open and transparent about the connections that are there in the ward and what the problems are and what the challenges are and how it's going to be addressed. And they should engage with the water utilities or the local governance to say, hey, please tell us what are your plans for the city in terms of accessing water, in terms of treating wastewater, and make sure that you put pressure so that they collect and treat every drop of wastewater. And make sure that if they're taking water from the Kaveri, that they get responsible for the forests of the Kaveri. Sometimes when you think about water and its management at a city level or national level, with all the complexity of the interconnections between urban and rural it can feel overwhelming to consider where to begin. But focusing on what you can do, even little things like switching to water-efficient devices like aerators or putting a drum below an external pipe, is a surprisingly great place to start and uh, begins to change how we think about and engage with water in our surroundings and in our taps. Um, In our bonus episode with Vishwanath, he talks about this in detail. The important thing, as he says, is to begin to participate. We have to make a beginning. I think in a city like Bangalore, for example, there are many groups which are doing this. So many groups are engaging with lakes. Many groups are engaging with rainwater harvesting. There are levels of engagement which people have based on the time available to them or their interests. But uh, if you don't engage with the city, you're doomed to live with what you get. In our upcoming extra, we ask Vishwanath what specific actions can be undertaken by us as citizens to change our relationship with water and begin to utilize it in the most optimum manner. 
He has some very interesting tips and tricks for us, so don't forget to listen in. And of course, we always love hearing back from you, so do follow us on our social media spaces or continue to share your thoughts and ideas with us at www.thecuriositycollective.org. This episode has been made with the support of Srinidhi Raghavan and produced by the Bangalore Recording Company.